So I'll start out and I'll end with the people who are actually doing much of the hard work, that is Harsha, Surbit, and Nisha. Um, uh, they they've put in the work in doing the coding and doing a huge amount of uh, data curation and analysis, as you will see. And then there are various members of the consortium who I will also uh, mention later. Okay, so uh, let's consider some kind of pathway model. Um, this is a block diagram. This is not individual molecules. These are uh, each of those has got lots and lots of individual molecules in it. So we actually had to work to come up with a way of, in fact, zooming in and looking at it. Um, I, I said to them, come up with a Google Earth-like thing so you can zoom in and see, see how horrible it really is, but do so in a manner where you don't lose track of the various pieces. So you can zoom in on any one of these if you so desire. And each one of them is extremely complicated. So that was just about visualization. So this is how uh, we did it some 20 years ago. Um, this was a, a much smaller model. It looks awful because we didn't have the, the ways to zoom in on different parts of it. Um, but the problem is that for a long time, people have been kind of stuck. That is a, a, a size of model with maybe 100 or so reactants and reactions seems to have been where people have plateaued in their efforts to come up with this kind of detailed uh, signaling reaction uh, kinetics-based model. So why have we been stuck all this time? So it's not because of computer power. Computers can do, um, and even ben then could do pretty much, uh, much larger calculations. It's not been because simulators can't do it. The, it's for, for the machine, it's just a matter of scaling it up. It's not been because we lack the data or the capabilities to get the numbers. What I think the, the problems have been are the, the following few, which is, first of all, these, all these models have been handcrafted. We've gone out, individually dug up the various citations, worked hard to uh, fit them into the model, and that takes a lot of time and effort. Having done that, if you want to use it in a different context or you want to mix it with something else, that turns out to be another whole exercise in handcrafting and rederivation, and that's not, easy, not been easy. When you build, build a model, you would like to then say, okay, I can reuse it wherever, but the trouble is that signaling pathways, the chemical reactions involved in them, are sufficiently tied up, sufficiently interconnected that you cannot just take one model and plug it into another one, which would have been a nice, clean engineering solution. It is harder than that. And finally, and perhaps not the least, it's extremely boring and extremely costly to go out and get the numbers. Whether it, this means hiring a bunch of people to go out and uh, mine the literature, or whether it means doing the experiments yourself, doing you know, many, many repeats at many, many time points to get the numbers. So all of these have meant that models have not really, in my experience, gone very much beyond a certain scale when you're dealing with detailed mass action kinetics. Okay, so this is where we thought we would try something new. Uh, Sanket, which means uh, signal in Sanskrit. Um, this is the signaling and neurophysiology knowledge resource for exper experiments and theory. This is a horrible backronym, but that's okay. Um, we, we like them. So this is now, uh, we've just got a prototype website up um, which uh, describes, which embodies the workflow that I'll be telling you about. Um, it's, we've had, uh, the consortium has been in existence for some, uh, some months now, for uh, clo getting close to a year. We've had a, we have a regular newsletter. Um, we have members from all over India and in fact some from uh, other places and we're very keen to get other people involved as well. So, since this is a session on workflows, I'm going to focus then on the workflow that we have uh, in the Sanket project. So we start by picking some process, some cellular process or uh, neurophysiological process that we're interested in. So let's suppose it's something to do with synapses and their uh, plasticity. Once you've picked a process, then you want to make a model of it. You want to say that these are the mechanisms that we believe in. Um, we want to get some data to populate those models. And then this part is where I'll focus most. How do you make the model as reproducible, as accurate, as good a representation of all that data? 
And then once you've got the model, there's many, many things that I'm sure you all know you would like to do with it, which range from uh, making predictions about how the brain works, how plasticity works, to examining various kinds of disease um, and diagnostics. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do with a nice detailed model of cellular function. Okay, so to start with, uh, we were all in different labs interested in different things. So we went about picking processes based on things that we were interested in. Um, one of them, which I'll be talking about most, is uh, the OTSIM, that is a, a, a project to simulate autism. So that is what I'll be telling you about uh, in most detail. But there's other people, for example, Suhita Nadkarni, who's from Aysar uh, Pune, one of our institutes in, in India. She's very interested in presynaptic processing. Um, and there's another grouping of people who are interested in synaptic plasticity. Basically, we can expand the topics we would like to look at uh, depending on how we're interested in it. So that was what we picked. Um, the members of this uh, group looking at the uh, autism project are listed over here, and they're from different parts of the, different, they're from all over the place. Fra uh, the autism, as uh, all of you know, I'll just uh, remind you very briefly. Um, one of the major causes of it is uh, is, fra is uh, fragile X syndrome. Um, uh, there's a, uh, what happens is that there's a, a nucleotide repeat, which causes. Uh, little fragile uh, dangling bit on your uh, X chromosomes. And this can lead in a fair fraction of cases to mental retardation. The protein that's been implicated, FMRP, has effects on translation. A fair number of uh, dendritic mRNAs are in fact targets of this. And it leads to different kinds of morphology in the, compared to the wild type, the mutants tend to have long, thin, immature looking dendritic spines. So this is the system we decided to look at. And in particular, we decided that we would look not at the systems or cellular level, we'd look at the subcellular level, what is happening at the synapse, uh, where, how is it that incoming synaptic activity is converted into protein synthesis. So that was the system that we picked. And of course, the other groupings picked other systems, other sets of pathways to look at. So uh, how do we go about making a model? What we did was, uh, first of all, we need the model uh, modeling framework. In this case, we chose uh, the simulator Moose, which is partly because we have developed it, but also partly because these uh, calculations uh, certainly involve multiple scales of, of functioning, ranging from the signaling pathways, the molecular uh, calculations that I'll be focusing on, but also looking at cellular biophysics and also because there's a synaptic morphology phenotype also on uh, how the geometry of the cell changes. To do this, we uh, dipped into a database, DOCS, which has got many, many signaling pathways, uh, particularly to do with the synapse. Um, we took a model of uh, synaptic kinases. We took another model related to uh, activity-driven protein synthesis. And because we were looking at autism, there were certain specific pathways that we know from the literature that had to be incorporated. So we took all of these things and stirred well and mixed it up to get a really, really big, nasty model, um, which is the, so that is the thing that I uh, started out showing you. So it's got the additional bits in there, and we merged together the kinases and the various uh, pathways involved in, in, uh, uh, in protein synthesis driven by synaptic activity. Okay, so this is a, a biggish model. It is substantially larger than anything we have tried before. I know that some people may have tried uh, yet bigger models, but let's see, let's see how we go along with this, because the goal of this, the next step of this, as you will see, is how do you make sure that this model has actually got its feet on the ground, that it's got some basis in reality. Okay, so just, as I, just to reiterate, each of those things is a fairly complicated block of reactions, and we need to parameterize, we need to specify numbers for every single one of those reactions. Every single one of those concentrations has to be defined in some way or the other. So that is our challenge. Um, and of course, that's not the end of our ambitions. At some point, we would like to include, for example, reaction diffusion. We'd like to include the stochastic processes uh, that are taking place in the communication with the spines and dendrites. We are going to certainly put in electrophysiology and calcium dynamics and morphology change. But for now, we have enough on our hands, as I'm sure you will see in a moment. Okay, so that was how to make the model. Next question was, how do we get the data? Now, in a perfect world, we would have 
entire institutions at our disposal generating these numbers for us. Um, this is not so easy. But we do have some uh, activities going on. In fact, we have been able to tap into a, a consortium activity on our own campus where uh, they're working with human iPSCs, hum human-induced plur pluripotent stem cells, which means that basically you can take uh, wild-type and disease uh, uh, patients, sorry, wild-type and disease uh, cells, differentiate them into neurons, and then study their physiology and chemical properties, something you cannot normally do with human brain tissue. So there's a bunch of things we have begun to do on them. Uh, we only have a little bit of data from this at this point. We would like to get human slice. We actually have a line into a, a, a hospital which uh, produces such things. So we hope in, in due course to be able to do that, that we haven't yet gotten going. Uh, mouse uh, tissue culture, there's a lot of things that we can do with that. And mouse slice. Now, as uh, you heard uh, right at the beginning of the, of the, of the day, that uh, you know mice are not monkeys, and monkeys are not people either. And uh, certainly, the, the, what we have in a dish is not really representative of what's going on in your head. Um, but what we, the best we can do is to try and get a few uh, sample points and try to interpolate or extrapolate to figure out what might be going on in the, in the actual brain, in the human brain. So this is how we're approaching it. The other side of it is to go to the literature. And the literature is vast and voluminous and extremely hard to parse, extremely hard to extract numbers from. So this is a job that uh, Nisha in particular has been involved with. She has uh, so far curated so, uh, some 230 to 250 experiments, um, which I'll show you about in more detail. And these are going to be the fundamental constraints that define our model. So, um, and one of the tools that we have in the, in the uh, FindSim uh, project, in the, in, sorry, in the Sanket project, is in fact a way of taking experiments from the literature and sticking the numbers uh, together, uh, putting in, uh, as you will see, the, the aspects of the experiments that need to be replicated by the model. Okay, so that was the first two steps of the workflow. Now we come to the heart of it, which is how do you, once you have this model, once you have these experiments codified, how do you get, how do you get to improve the model? So um, there are various components for that. There's, of course, the simulator. You need to be able to run the calculations. Then there's FindSim, which is a, a project that um, I actually spoke about uh, uh, in a previous uh, meeting, in, uh, INCF meeting. Um, and which has been published. So what this does is it allows, it, it specifies a way of codifying uh, experiments and to uh, take those codified experiments and run them on the model. So you take the stimuli that were given in the experiment and you apply them to the model and then you compare the model outcome with what happened uh, uh, in the real experiment. And you can do that from the web interface which can also manage this uh, uh, growing database of experiments. And then we run all of this through something we call HORS, HOS, Hierarchical Optimization of System Simulations. And what this does is it deploys the FindSim uh, numerical engines, uh, the, the calculations of FindSim, which again lie on, on Moose. And then it can run these things in parallel. And it deploys these uh, to do the optimization using uh, some standard algorithms. And I'll be telling you about these different steps. OK, so FindSim is this framework to integrate neural data and signaling models. It's got its own website, which is all part of the Sanket portal. And the approach is as follows. So here's our model, which I've described to you. For the experiment, we need to take the stimuli that were given, what were the, prop, what were the conditions under which the experiment was done. And we also need to have what were the readouts, what were the outcomes of the experiments. So we put all of these things into a database. We have a database of models. We have a database of, of uh, experiments. And then we run the calculations on it. And we compare the simulation output with what the actual experiments gave us. Um, and we can then compare the, uh, the real versus the, the simulated results and use that as a score to decide how to improve the model. So this is the uh, flow chart for uh, doing the calculations within FindSim. So there's a whole bunch of experiment types that FindSim now accommodates. Um, you can have the most straightforward one is you have your, your uh, system of, of, uh, 
of cells or, or, or reactions in a test tube, and at some point you put in a reagent, and you get some kind of time course of response of some readout. Uh, another very common thing which uh, is used a lot in uh, biochemistry experiments is you do a dose response curve. You apply fixed amounts of some stimulus and you measure how much response there is. Uh, bar chart uh, experiments are common. Uh, you can also do things in the electrophysiological domain. You can do current or voltage clamp experiments. In fact, this is uh, a sort of undersampled version of uh, the Hodgkin Huxley uh, paper from 70 years ago. Uh, you can do standard uh, potentiation kinds of experiments, and many, many more. So these are all codified in, in, the, in, the, uh, in this workflow. And now we can uh, codify it on the web. You can run it from the web. And in due course, very soon, we'll be able to optimize it also from the web. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. OK, so let's get to the optimization part, which is the, the heart of this. Um, so level one is we need to optimize subparts of the model. And this is something which can be parallelized because you can do each one uh, at the same time. You don't, at this point, we're just separating out each of these 40 or so different signaling pathways, and you can do the optimization of them individually. Um, so that's nice. Level two, you want to take these modules and look at the crosstalk. And so we need to optimize for the cross reactions. That is a little bit harder to parallelize, but some aspects of it can be done. And level three, we want to do multi-scale calculations. That is, we may want to uh, optimize for when you have certain reactions occurring, say, in the dendritic spine or in the spine head, and others happening in the dendrite. So now you have to cross, look at the crosstalk between those. And so this, or for that matter, between the electrical activity and the chemical activity. So each of these things can happen um, in, in, a, in a hierarchy. And the reason, one other reason why it's important to do it in a hierarchy is because if you have... If you have a multi-thousand parameter model and you try to optimize all thousand or so of those at the same time, you're not going to get very far. Uh, those of you who've, done, who've tried to optimize things will realize that even the best algorithms will run aground if you try to do that. So um, doing it in a hierarchical way, which is also in, fortunately how one does experiments, makes it uh, feasible to do this. Uh, just a glimpse of this. Um, so you might be able to do a reasonable optimization for a small part of the model, but eventually you will need to fit in the whole model. Um, if you start with a single subset, say any one of these, and each of these has now been optimized, um, you would take the individual reactions and you would take a bunch of experiments which happen to probe those reactions, which uh, constrain the rates of all these possible reactions. Then once you've decided the reactions, once you decide the experiments, you figure out which parameters you permit your optimizer to tweak. And those are the ones in, in red. And having done that, you, you unleash your optimizer, which is a, you know, a fairly standard algorithm um, to optimize these. You can assign different weights to say which experiments you want to assign more credibility to. And then you turn things, turn the handle basically, you let the, the computer churn away at this. Um, and run the calculation. So basically what you're doing at this point, just envision it. You're running, uh, you're, you're specifying an experiment, you're running the experiment on a model, you're comparing the experiment output to the model output, and you're giving it a score. And you're doing this in parallel for a whole bunch of different experiments which all engage these pathways. And each of, so having run through all of these experiments, you get a sort of summed score saying that at this point, the model fits, this model fits all of these experiments to this degree. Once you've done that, you can go to the next iteration of the optimizer. So all of this is done, uh, can be, so all of these things can be done in parallel, and then you go to the next step of the optimization process. And so at the end of it, you end up with some modified parameters, you end up hopefully with an improved model, and here are some examples. So this is where you started, and this is so this pre-optimization, post-optimization. So this is one of the experiments. Uh, not such a great fit, a much better fit. This one started out a really terrible fit. It's still not a great fit, but it's better than it was. Um, this one actually got worse, but this one got better. So the model is approaching not just one experiment, but it's trying to approach at the same time all of the experiments, which is why it's a, a somewhat touchy uh, optimization problem. 
And so in this manner, we have actually gone through the process, or I should say Nisha has gone through the process of optimizing all of these individual modules uh, independently. And the next step is to look at the crosstalk. So this is where we are right now with this uh, process of optimization. And um, it's a similar kind of thing. You pick up a set of experiments that define how the pathways interact, and now you try and, opt uh, try and optimize for those uh, rate constants. So um, we've uh, recently had uh, a very productive uh, Google Summer of Code uh, interaction, um, student being Hao Chen from uh, uh, Peking, Uni uh, Peking University. Uh, he was uh, uh, sort of handheld by Surbit, who is from, from our group. And so this, I think, is a, a kind of a nice illustration of the, of the reach of the INCF. That is, we spoke to the uh, Neuroscience Gateway people, Amit Mazumdar and his colleagues. We had Google uh, providing input for the uh, Google Sum of Code project. And of course, the INCF brought it, brought it all together. OK, so this has been the, the, the core of it, how we went about the optimization. I'll uh, give you a glimpse of some of the things that we are already beginning to do with these models. Uh, one, for example, is to compare what happens in the wild type version of the model with various mutant versions of the model. So we can optimize based on uh, mutant parameter, mutant ex experiments on mutants to get a different version of the model that applies to uh, the mutant. Uh, so for example, we know that in the mutant, the uh, levels of these different molecules uh, have been changed. And we can run the calculations and say that, for example, for a certain stimulus, we get different kinds of responses. So this is a very early stage of, uh, of analysis, but we can already start to play with the models and say, this is what happens in the wild type, and this is what happens in the mutant. Um, another thing that one can do is one can play with or examine how well the large body of experimental literature fits different theories of, uh, of uh, these mutants. So for example, there's the metabotropic glutamate receptor theory, MGLUR theory of, uh, of, uh, of fragile X syndrome. But there's a competing uh, theory also, the cyclic AMP theory. And which of these is probably accounts for more of the observations? This is something we can now uh, begin to play with. And there's, of course, for pharmacology, there's the, the enduring question of what are the best targets and what will be the side effects. So for example, if you were to believe in the MGLUR theory, you would expect that uh, this would be a useful target, uh, but then you would have all of these as potential side effects. So we can calculate those. Uh, or if you believe the cyclic AMP theory, this might be one of the targets, and then you'd have side effects in different parts of the model. So these are now things we can put numbers to and say uh, these would be the side effects if you put in a drug which targeted that molecule or that molecule. OK, so uh, to wrap up then, uh, what I've done is I've just tried to describe to you uh, the workflow that we've developed for this project, um, this consortium. Um, it starts with coming up with a system that you're interested in. Um, then one has to develop a model for that system, of course, closely based on a lot of data that pertains to that. And then we have a whole system, a whole workflow to take the available data, structure it, and be able to use the data in a very systematic, in a principled way to make a better model. And finally, then, it's up to the, to the people in the project to figure out what they want to do with it. So that is the, the essence of this project. And to wrap up, I would especially like to thank Harsha, Nisha, and Surbit, who have been core to the project. Uh, Jyoti, we know the various other people have contributed, the various collaborators and, and consortium members, and funding from various people. So, thank you. Fantastic project, congratulations indeed. Uh, so far I've seen only big models which have been done within this ecocyc and the biocyc projects, which are the microbes and really mm -hmm. small organisms. Mm -hmm. uh, they are still in open systems, but it, it seems to be a bit easier to handle this openness than in your case. So uh, what, uh, what do you do with the rest of the world, so to say, when you have a model like that? So uh, I'm not so familiar with those models, but are those more gene, the gene regulatory networks? Yeah, the gene and metabolic yes. etc. I mean, the whole, uh, well, ecocyc yes, uh, is, yes. is Hershey Collie, of course, but very complex models. Right. So one thing is that 
they have access to, uh, uh, I would say, a much more structured set of experimental data because you can sort of grind through those experiments in a, in a, you know, a very systematic way. You have the mutants, you have the metabolic conditions. So that, that really helps. This is, I mean, certainly they've done an outstanding job on doing this, but I think here we are up against a much more heterogeneous set of experiments. And that was one of the big challenges that we had to face, to come up with a way that you could take very diverse kinds of experiments and still use them. But, but the question is about the openness, right? Because in the case of microbes and the small systems, you, you know uh, what kind of nutrition or molecules are interacting with this system. Uh, in, in your case, you're just a part of the, the, the whole It's world. true, yes, yes. So, so, so how do you treat the openness, the, uh, the uh, yeah. I would say, limits of... Uh, that's, yeah, that's a great question. So this is, this is the question you ask the person who's looking under the lamppost for the key, right? Yeah, you're looking there because that's where the light is. No, it's based on our best judgment. That is, we take what we can see from the literature that these are key pathways that must be involved, which is why we incorporated a few additional pathways beyond the ones that we had started with. Um, it is very likely that as we go through this process, we will say that, okay, some interaction is simply not working with the uh, available model, so we have to extend the model. So that's a systematic way of doing it. Um, we'll, you know, that is, that is part, of the, part of the process. Any further questions? So actually, I, I would have one question. Uh, just, um, so I was wondering, like these, the, the advantage of having these workflows is, is that you can actually rerun yes. uh, these workflows again and again. So from your experience, what happens if you get new data and you get to optimize against an extended data set? How stable are these estimates in your experience of so parameters? So at this point, so generally, okay, zero order is reasonably stable. Every so often new data will show us that our existing model is inadequate, in which case we need to go back and add some more interactions that are not there uh, currently. But the whole point of doing it this way is that you can incrementally add new data as it comes in. Yeah. Okay. If there are no further questions, let's... Uh... Oh, there's one more. <laughs> In, in the fine sim workflow, I imagine there's, there's parts of this that are very uh, specific to the kind of system that you're, you're, you're optimizing, and then other parts that are more general, right, that could apply to maybe some, a different kind of uh, experimental system or a different mm -hmm. level of modeling. Mm -hmm. To what extent are those, dis are those, are those like, is there a distinction maintained between those, or is it kind of built end to end for this, this kind of, uh, these kinds of models? So it's, it's, it's extendable. Um, the things that we put in were based on our general interest in looking at neurophysiology and the underlying signaling. So that's why we have a range of things from the standard biochemical readouts to also the standard uh, electrophysiological readouts and the slice LTP kind of readouts. Should more things come up that need to be incorporated, we can, we can do so. The, Commonality in all of these is that you specify the experiment, you specify the experimental result, you run the simulation, and you can compare. And therefore, you can apply the same algorithm. So the specification of the experiment has two parts. You specify what was the uh, preparation, so in other words, what part of the overall model was necessary, was used by the experimentalist, and you specify what were the inputs. So let's say a stimulus at such and such a time, or a shock pulse at such and such a time. And then you also specify what were the readouts, which could be a chemical readout or an electrical readout. And that's the specification. <laughs>